Citizens Alliance um, entitled Food for Climate, Activating Transformation from the Inside Out. So we're delighted to have you join us here today, um, both in person and online. Um, my name's Alana Cragen. I'm a climate policy coordinator with UNDP's Climate Promise, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. Um, so to begin with, just some, some housekeeping. So um, if you're joining us online on Zoom, uh, please do ensure that your, your mics are muted. And there is the option of simultaneous translation in Spanish and English. So you can just um, click on the little world icon um, on Zoom and you, you can choose your language. So um, we have a full and exciting agenda today. Um, we'll be hearing from leading academics, from indigenous leaders, from mindfulness practitioners, development experts, um, and of course, the, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance members. So we'll be talking about the role of interchange as a critical and complementary approach to building regenerative, inclusive, and resilient food systems, and how that can support climate action. So for the first part of this session, um, I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panelists. So first off, we have Andrew Bovernick, who is our um, global head of UNDP's food and agricultural um, commodities systems practice. And he's joining us virtually from uh, Panama. So building on more than 25 years of experience working on transforming food systems through collaborative action, Andrew saw the need and profound potential of leveraging interchange for systems transformation, and this specifically for the development sector. So Andrew envisioned uh, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance in 2020 and is the founder and team lead. We also have Thomas Legrand, a lead technical advisor of the Conscious Food Systems Alliance and who's joining from France, where he lives next to Plum Village, uh, the monastery of Zen master Tich Nhat Han. Uh, Thomas is also the author of Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for New Development Paradigm. We're also joined by Vi Vairoa Ika Goldman, an indigenous activist and representative of the Rapa Nui peoples Isla da Pascua of Polynesia. Welcome. And uh, last but not least, Christine Wamsler, who is Professor of Sustainability Science at Lud Lund University um, and who is also founder and director of the Contemplative Sustainable Futures Program. So Christine's work in linking sustainability um, and interchange is contributing to frame this nascent field of work. Um, and she's been extensively cited in, in IPCC reports. She's also been a core partner of the Conscious Food Systems Alliance since, 2000, since 2021 and has uh, co-authored the Conscious Food System Alliance Rationale for Action Report. So, to kick us off, um, I'll pass to you, Andrew, um, and, and ask, you know, why is interchange so important for transforming food systems, for tackling climate change and achieving the sustainable development goals? Over to you, Andrew. Hi, hi, Alana, and hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and thank you all for coming. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome you all to this, to this event. And, and I really feel that this is a very uh, special and unique event uh, in general, globally, but particularly at the COP. I know at the COP there's been a lot of events, and so um, you've got to choose your time wisely, and we're very pleased that you're with us. Um, you know, why is this event so special? Because... Uh, food and food systems have been increasingly uh, given attention at the COP with the links between food and climate. But I believe we're the only initiative, or one of the only initiatives that is looking to work with and change uh, food systems um, through looking at and promoting and supporting what we call consciousness. And so not looking and promoting uh, technical solutions. Uh, as the introduction said, I've been working for over 25 years, actually more like 30 years now uh, in the field of development, spent most of the time on reports and technical analysis. And you know, I think we all see now more and more that, that we need other ways 
of both changing ourselves and helping others change the way they think in order for us to have the right mindsets to actually make choices that are more sustainable, both within the food systems and, and beyond. And so I think what's important for all of you as we go through today and hopefully together beyond today is, is when you think about consciousness, don't get too worried about that term. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For me, it's really about, if you want bringing more humanity back into our work, for me personally, it's maybe becoming less of an email machine and connecting more to, to the people I work with, uh, both my colleagues, but as well as the farmers, my government counterparts, the companies, and look at everyone and connect with everyone as a human being as we, as we work uh, together. It's bringing compassion to our work, mindfulness, and really at the end of the day, when we think about climate, if we don't actually care about the next generation, we're not really going to make the tough choices now. So bringing caring into the solution or the equation, at least, is, is extremely powerful. And as we talk a lot in COFSA about, we are trying to help connect more to ourselves, connect to others, and connect to nature. And I think this, these ideas, this approach is really extremely powerful. It's what we all need now. It's what the world needs now. It is different from so many of the other initiatives out there and sessions you'll be listening to and participating in uh, at COP. And I believe, you know, what we're trying to support here and promote and elevate is very aspirational. You know, we are really uh, putting our attention on, on, on changing mindsets, but also not just looking at and working with people's minds, but opening up their hearts as well. And this is very aspirational, but that's what I believe we, we need I need for myself to be more open-hearted and for us collectively to be more open-hearted for us to make the right choices about food and about climate. So thank you all for coming. We are a movement. This is an alliance. We are stronger together. So please, for those of you who are new to COFSA, I hope you enjoy this. Enjoy the experience and then contact us afterwards and, and come join us as we continue this journey for many, many years to come, because I think what we're trying to do here will remain relevant uh, uh, always. Um, we have a wonderful event with amazing speakers, a very beautiful mix of uh, different speakers, topics and experiences, including uh, some mindful practice by my good friend Tubton. And I just say that it's been, I'm sure, a very stressful, hectic week at COP. So sit back and enjoy and, and join the experience with us and hopefully uh, join us and, and work with us as we move forward with all of this in the future. So thank you all. And I hand back. Thank you so much, Andrew. And um, yes, couldn't agree more. We we really need this this more compassionate and conscious approach to food systems and ensuring that it really is inclusive and and those that are are on the ground. We're listening to them. We're making sure their voices are heard um, and they're they're with us on the way. So I'm now honoured to pass the floor to Viola, um, who will share with us a blessing from Rapunai. Um, she'll be doing a, a, a song and dance um, and then giving a speech or sharing a short video and um, sharing some experiences on building local and resilient food systems from the Rapa Nui Cosmo Vision. Over to you.
Thank you so much. Wow. Eh, esta es una canción que habla un poco de la historia de Rapanui. Yes. Uh, so we are going to translate a bit the song. Uh, she was saying that this is a song that talks about her people in Rapanui. En, en el momento que estoy bailando y hago así, es justamente cuando nuestro rey Atamutequena toma el pasto y el pasto se lo entrega al, al chileno, al colonizador. Somos hermanos y todo, pero al colonizador le dice... El pasto es tuyo, pero la tierra es de nosotros. Basically, the, the movement she was doing, uh, it symbolized when the king of the land was giving uh, the, the resources in a way to the neighboring countries in Latin America, to Chile and which other country? Uh, Chile. To Chile, saying you can have this, but the land belongs to us, to the people. Eh, y en resumen es eh, la historia de la isla un momento duro donde casi se extingue la Panui, éramos 111 pero que a pesar de todo fuimos resilientes y pudimos eh, crecer y actualmente estamos vivos la cultura está viva so basically yeah the total population uh, decreasing Uh, due to colonization and occupation, but they're a very resilient people and they're still there and the culture is still alive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that deeply moving and insightful offering. Thank you. Do we have a video? Yeah. Could we play the video? Oh, sorry, Naomi. Yes. <laughs> Con el programa Huertos Familiares, que partimos el 2020, cuando parte la pandemia, donde vimos que la economía de la isla, sumado al, al cierre de la isla, 
iba a afectar la economía familiar. Y pensamos y planificamos como dirección apoyar a la familia, apoyar a la comunidad. Entonces, ¿qué mejor que la construcción de un huerto? Después de dos años de pandemia, logramos hacer eh, 1.114 huertos y logramos seleccionar eh, 25 familias con las cuales armamos una red de productores agroecológicos donde el propósito de esta red es impulsar la soberanía alimentaria de Arapanui y poder asegurar el consumo de alimentos nutritivos ya que nos preocupamos del suelo, le entregamos abono natural y insecticidas naturales también, eh, además de la, de la asesoría técnica. Como red hemos llegado a un acuerdo de que las primeras tres cosechas se regalaron a la comunidad. Luego de la cuarta cosecha de esta organización, ellos van a empezar a, a vender estas canastas. Una canasta bien variada con todos los alimentos que, que crecen en los huertos y eh, para poder trabajar el comercio justo, la alimentación local, la alimentación saludable, entonces la idea es poder ofrecerlo a la comunidad. Estas acciones van en línea con la ODS número 2, Hambre Cero, y la ODS número 12, Producción y Consumo Responsable de la Agenda 2030 de las Naciones Unidas. Uno de los objetivos a desarrollar entonces en una década es lograr que el planeta sea sustentable, alimentariamente hablando. Y Rapa Nui lo que está haciendo aquí está eh, a través de este concepto iniciando ese proceso. Lo estamos haciendo con la familia, lo estamos haciendo con las vecinas y los vecinos y esto se va a ir escalando y se va a ir multiplicando por sí sola. El tiempo no es importante, lo importante es enfocarnos en hacer bien para que del fruto de ella podamos nosotros entonces sustentarnos, podemos garantizar nuestro alimento aquí mismo en nuestra casa. Thank you, thank you again. That's such important work. And yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. So from the science of inner and outer transformation, um, our next speaker is Christine Wamsler, who'll be joining virtually from Sweden. So Christine, from your scientific perspective, can you tell us why our consciousness and inner human capacities are key for unlocking systems change and building more regenerative and resilient food systems? Thank you, Alana, for your question. Um, in simple terms, one can say that there is increasing scientific consensus that creating sustainable regenerative systems doesn't only require change in our external world, technology, wider socioeconomic structures and ecosystems. Instead, it has to go hand in hand with a fundamental shift in our relationships in the way we think about ourselves, each other and life as a whole. So whereas current efforts to transform food systems tend to focus on external solutions and how to increase the externally driven motivation of stakeholders, for instance, by offering them economic incentives, sustainable regenerative systems also require nurturing certain inner capacities of stakeholders and their intrinsic motivation. So we urgently need new, more integrative approaches that link the inner and outer dimensions of sustainability. And recognizing the increasing scientific consensus in this field, this need has even been highlighted in this, year, this year's assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which note that while they know the important role of inner transformation in general of our beliefs and values as a lever for accelerating sustainable development. So to address this need, in recent years, new scientific concept theories and frameworks have been developed and they demonstrate the importance of linking inner and outer transformation sustainability and they also show how related processes can be supported. Thanks to these scientific developments, we know that systemic change and inner change processes 
are deeply interconnected and that tapping into people's inner capacities might have great potential for transforming systems. And we scientists call these capacities a deep leverage point for change. And by inner capacities, we mean our individual and collective awareness, mindsets, beliefs, values, worldviews, plus the associated inner qualities and skills that influence the way we see and relate to ourselves, others, and nature. This relationship is crucial because we have realized that climate change and other sustainability challenges are a reflection of an inner human crisis. Climate change is in fact the result of modern society's story or narrative of separation, which assumes that our thinking mind is separate from our feelings and bodily sensations, that each of us is separate from everyone else, that some humans are superior to others and that we humans are separate and superior to the rest of the natural world. So treating the environment as a resource for the benefit of humankind and as a means for our economy has led to its abuse and destruction. But if we understand climate change as a reflection of an inner human crisis, this also means that conscious connection or reconnection with the self, others, and nature can serve as a foundation for creating more regenerative systems. And importantly, such a relational paradigm also lies at the root of many wisdom-based traditions. On this basis, so-called consciousness approaches can be understood as approaches that integrate the consideration and cultivation of inner capacities into external interventions. These Approaches also leverage certain practices such as contemplative, psychological and cognitive behavioral practices that can actively cultivate inner capacities. So from the emergent science and theory, we also know that consciousness approaches can and should be integrated into interventions across three interconnected levels, the individual, the collective and the system. At Individual level, it involves implementing measures like education, training, and coaching that can help a person to tap into their inner potential to support change. Measures at the collective or group level aim to support related training environments to create a culture of growth and nourish fields of change, for instance, by means of transformative multi stakeholder spaces and networks. Finally, measures at the system level aim to support policy integration in order to systematically mainstream the consideration of people's intrinsic capacities and values into existing institutional and political systems. And this might entail modifying organizations' policies and regulations, their tools for project management, monitoring and evaluation, and reallocating resources. So to sum up the emerging science theories and concepts of inner order transformation allow us to understand that consciousness approaches can help bring about a shift in individual and collective awareness. It is a fundamental shift in our relationships that can emerge by nourishing people's inner capacities and their connection or reconnection with the self, others and nature, all of which are crucial for creating more regenerative food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and it's really great to hear, yeah, the strong scientific basis for this work. And I think it's quite important for us to note that, that this has already been recognized um, in, in the IPCC report. So very relevant for the audience here at COP. So now we will hear from Thomas. So um, Thomas is our lead technical advisor. And as, as yeah, you may have noticed, I've been saying Conscious Food Systems Alliance, and, but, but what is it exactly? So Thomas, I'll, I'll let you introduce what this alliance is and how those listening today um, and here at Sharm El Sheikh can, can get engaged and be part of this movement. Thanks, over to you. Thank you, Anana. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be uh, with you today and to share this work that we are building over the last uh, two years with our, our great group of, of partners. Um, we can uh, 
have a presentation that maybe we can show on slides. So we are uh, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. We are a movement of food and agriculture practitioners, but also consciousness practitioners united around a common goal to support people from across food and agriculture systems to cultivate the inner capacities that activate systemic change and regeneration. So we can move to the next slide, Christine. As uh, we have worked with Christine on this uh, Rational for Action report, which uh, presents the key concepts uh, for all work. And she has already explained uh, this model of transformation, basically uh, uh, applying consciousness approach. Uh, and she mentioned you know, the contemplative practices such as uh, mindfulness and um, uh, natural connection, uh, psychological and cognitive behavioral practices, how we convene also, how we create deep safe space and uh, where uh, communication, deep communication can really happen through nonviolent communication, deep listening, etc. How would you apply these at three levels, individual, group and institutional, to create shift in consciousness through the cultivation of inner capacities? Uh, the transformative qualities and skills around being, thinking, relating, collaborating and acting, and also the change in connection with self, others and natures to support the transition towards regenerative food systems. So we want to apply that, uh, take a whole system approach and apply that to the, the whole food and agriculture systems. Uh, at the landscape level, for example, working with uh, farmers' uh, well-being, mental health. We know this is a, a big issue uh, globally. Uh, we also uh, aware that a lot of regenerative movement at the grassroots levels builds on different values and mindsets. So how we can we foster these? How can we support also and, and strengthen uh, traditional wisdom in relation to food and agriculture? How can we work uh, differently on uh, approach uh, in a different way, more intentionally policy processes, maybe starting with a kind of, of retreat to allow people to uh, start from uh, a, a different uh, place within or through immersion in local communities or with nature uh, to make these processes much more intentional and how we can have also uh, dialogues or we can build uh, safe, deep, connecting transformative spaces for multi-stakeholder dialogues. And finally, uh, how can we transform supply chains through uh, transform the culture, for example, of companies to support more this sustainability regenerative agenda and how we can, uh, uh, working on consumption, how we can promote traditional food cultures. Uh, we know that it's a big problem that often Traditional food are devalued, especially in the global uh, south, and marketing emphasized Western, modern, imported food. So how we can we, on the contrary, uh, promote traditional local food cultures and also offer uh, education program that support based on uh, behavioral insights, mindfulness practices, for example, to support uh, more healthy, local and sustainable diets. So we want to work on all these, uh, these issues um, and uh, build a, a global community of conscious food systems practitioners. Can move to the next slide. Thank you. So that's our uh, model. We are about to launch a digital uh, platform for all of our members to be able to connect and practice together. Uh, we will have also, we launch uh, a, a series of uh, collective inquiries to look into these different subjects so that we can reflect together, we can learn from each other experience and we can build collaboration because Obviously, ultimately, the idea is to foster application of this agenda of work uh, 
every members, uh, so some are already doing that in UNDP. We have already started to integrate these kind of approaches into some projects. And we want to, we have designed uh, an incubator of project and we are uh, raising funds for uh, this, uh, to be able to channel funding, to test, to experiment around these uh, type of interventions. So uh, this is a movement convened by UNDP, which uh, holds a secretariat, and we will be launching an inner council, which would be a kind of steering committee. And we will have also a quarterly gathering of uh, Alliance members, uh, in addition to all the, the programs that we'll be offering online on this digital platform. So we have been working on, uh, on this initiative for the last two years. Uh, the first year from September 2020 was about the setting up, uh, define an initial concept, build a core group of partners and engage in some uh, visioning and strategic uh, discussions about the Alliance. Uh, a year ago in September 2021, we, uh, or in October, we launched uh, the Breezing Room, which was a space for core partners to connect with themselves and uh, co-create together um, this Conscious Food System Alliance um, program. And uh, we have developed together some foundational documents, such as this Rational for Action report that we have mentioned. We have also uh, a manifesto uh, developed. And we have discussed, you know, how can we uh, define the governance and how we can we support more um, growing our community. And right now we are moving into this first third phase of implementation with the launching of this uh, digital platform, uh, starting also to offer uh, trainings and implement interventions. We are planning a global event uh, in April. And, uh, and working actively on fundraising and uh, will be also uh, developing a scale-up strategy for the, for the next phase. So as we, we mentioned now, we have here are the, the, the achievements so far. We have been a very solid and, um, and great group of core partners. We have done, we have positioned this agenda through some uh, different documents uh, to, to bring some thought leadership uh, around this agenda. We have developed a pipeline of interventions for funding through the uh, COFSA incubator. We have grown uh, the community around COFSA with more than, we've been in touch with more than 150 people. Uh, we are about to, we have developed and are about to launch this digital community platform. And uh, we have built a global network of local hubs who offer educational programs, retreats, mixing both this inner dimension with a focus on food and agriculture. And we uh, are, uh, they are discussing, you know, how to bring their experience into a global distributed uh, curriculum. We have also uh, worked a lot on the communication, the branding of the Alliance, and have set up uh, a website. So uh, this is in a few words, you know, what we are about. There is much more uh, information on our website, consciousfoodsystems.org. And you, we are uh, welcoming you to join our movement. You can find on the website how to submit uh, an a very simple application form to uh, join this alliance. Thank you. Look forward to engaging with you. Great, thank you so much, Toma. It's uh, yeah, really great to see how this alliance came about and, and where we're going and, and how people can get involved. So thank you so much for that overview. So we've, we recognize you know, that consciousness or mindfulness is something that we really need to experience and to practice to see the transformational role um, that it can play in our daily lives. And of course, the bigger community and, and, and food systems. So to get a flavor of that, we're, we're joined today by Gaylong Tubton, um, who is a Buddhist monk, a meditation teacher, and best-selling author from the UK. And Tubton is engaged in bringing mindfulness, oh, fly. <laughs> so Tubton's engaged in bringing mindfulness to a variety of sectors for um, social transformation. So Tubton will be leading us today in a short mindfulness practice together. So Tubton, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alana. And thank you, Thomas and Andrew, for inviting me again to be part of this wonderful initiative. 
Um, I'm going to be uh, leading all of you in a short mindfulness practice. But before doing that, I wanted to highlight a few key points. We've been talking about the importance of uh, our inner capacity and how um, connecting and developing with our inner capacity can achieve external change. We've been talking about consciousness. We've been talking about awareness. So the, these terms all definitely give a sense of waking something up. And I think many people, when they're new to mindfulness, tend to think of it as a sort of shutting down, almost like going to sleep. Uh, people often sit down and think they're supposed to clear their mind and go into a kind of underwater state where there are no thoughts and they're just blank. And that is actually not mindfulness at all. That, that is just like trying to put oneself into an unconscious state. To wake up our consciousness is very much about being present and learning how to be less influenced by the habits that block or impede or obscure our inner potential from shining. Our inner potential, our inner capacity for awareness, for compassion, for wisdom, all the qualities of our internal mind that tend to be squashed by our stress, our worry and our fear. So meditating is about connecting with that inner space of rich potential and then allowing that to become the place from which we act in the world. It is also about being less controlled and influenced by the habits that help us to fall into states of greed, materialism, um, overuse of, of resources so that the planet suffers. All of these are habits that are like mud on the crystal. And the meditation practice is about washing away the mud. So for the practice we're going to do today, we're going to sit quietly and focus on our breathing. But I want to emphasize that when thoughts and distractions come up to take us away from the breathing, that is not a sign of failure at all. That does not mean we have lost our meditation. Actually, it's a very dynamic process of regaining our awareness when we realize our mind has wandered and then bringing the attention back to the breath. And this process of regaining and returning is exactly what meditation is all about. Because every time we regain our awareness and realize the mind has wandered, and every time we return to the breath, we are gaining more power over our own mind. We are uh, building our authority over our thoughts and emotions, which means that in the long term, we can have greater authority over the habits that tend to take us into unhappiness and greed. So those habits will have less authority over us. So for the practice, it's very good to sit up straight in your chair, to have a sense of physical balance in terms of how you sit, so have your feet planted flat on the ground. Place your hands with the palms down on the tops of your knees or the tops of your thighs. Try to have as straight a back as possible. If you have any discomfort or um, physical challenge that you need to work with, use a cushion, use a pillow. Of course, make yourself comfortable and don't stress your body. But it's good to try to be as upright as possible. Relax the shoulders. The shoulders are often where people hold tension. Our shoulders tend to be very hunched up. Relax the shoulders. Relax the body. Be present with your physical posture. Now, the first key component in our practice is to establish the intention of profound, limitless, unconditional compassion. So this means to spend a moment creating the motivation or intention that we are going to meditate, not just for our own well-being and benefit, but also for the benefit of others. Through our meditation, our compassion will grow, our consciousness will expand, our actions will come from the right place, we can help the world. So we're trying to establish that intention right at the start of the session so that the session comes from that place. So take a moment to think, 
I'm going to meditate for my own benefit and the benefit of all other sentient beings and the planet as a whole. Now take your focus to your body. Start by being aware of your hands and fingers. Your hands are resting on your legs. There is a sense of contact between your skin and your clothing. Feel the texture of the clothing that you're wearing on your legs. Feel it under your palms and fingers. Mindfulness is very much about a direct perception of the present moment without it being filtered through too many thoughts, ideas, and concepts. It's a direct experience of reality in the here and now. So just sense your hands resting on your legs. Feel the sensation of contact. Now take your focus to your body. Feel the chair under you. You can feel the contact between your backside and the chair and also the your lower back and the back of the chair. Bring your focus up to your shoulders. Notice how your shoulders probably hold some tension. Just noticing helps the shoulders to release and relax. Feel your shoulders drop. Feel your shoulders literally wash away the tension like water flowing off a cliff. And now bring the focus to your breathing. Breathe very naturally. There's no need to breathe deeply or slowly or loudly. Just let your breath be as natural as it can be. But start to notice how your breath creates movement in your body. There is the rising and falling of the diaphragm. Perhaps you feel that in your chest, perhaps you feel it lower down in your belly. Just feel the movement of the body with the breath. When your mind wanders into distractions, thoughts, ideas, memories, noises from outside, just gently reconnect, bring yourself back again and again to the body. Remember to breathe naturally without any pressure or effort, just let the breath do its natural thing. Okay, let's sharpen the focus. Bring the focus up to your face. Feel where the air comes in and out. Is it your nose? Is it your mouth? Locate where you are breathing. Breathe through your nose if, it, if you can. If it's uncomfortable, then of course, breathe through your mouth. But feel the air coming in and out of the end of your nostrils. Feel the air brushing against the skin of your nose. Or if you breathe through your mouth, feel the air against your lips. Really focus on the sensation of entering and leaving with the air. This is a way to sharpen up one's concentration, one's focus on the present moment. And when the thoughts take you away, which they will, don't get frustrated, just gently return. Return to the breath again and again. Let's try that for a few minutes.
Notice how the mind gets lost very easily in sleepiness or distraction. This is all part of the process. Just return again and again. Don't feel that you're getting it wrong. Just keep returning to the breath. Let's try another few minutes. Now, as the mind becomes more focused, more centered on the present moment, just let go of the focus on the breath and take a moment to deeply relax into yourself and to ask yourself the question, who am I without all of my stress, without all the busyness, without all the thinking, planning, worrying, or the discursive thought, who is this essence of me? And what is my place in this world? What am I here to do? Try to connect with your inner being, with its sense of purpose, compassion, and a wish to connect with others, a wish for the world to be a happier, more positive place. Connect with that calm space of purpose and love deep within your heart. And now make an internal commitment that you want to carry that compassion and kindness into everything you do, and that you want to train yourself further to go deeper and deeper into that compassionate state, and for that state to become the way you act in the world, the way you behave, the way we try to benefit others. And stop there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tubton. Um, thank you for, for guiding us through that practice and, and helping us generate yeah, those or connect to those inner capacities so we can be of benefit not only to ourselves, but to, to our families, our friends, our, our wider communities, um, and for the benefit of all. So thank you so much for that. So now we're going to hear from some of the incredible members of the Alliance about their work and their insights from the field um, and how they're planning to bring this forth through, through the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. So you've been very patient, both uh, here with us in person and online. So thank you so much. Um, and first, I'd like to introduce uh, Maximilian Abulish. So Maximilian is Sustainable Development Lead for Sekim a holistic initiative for sustainable development, which has been incredibly successful in greening the Egyptian desert through biodynamic agriculture since 1977. So welcome, welcome Maximilian. We also have Teresa Corsal, who is joining us virtually from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Teresa is a food activist, designer and eco chef. She's the founder of Instituto Maniva, an NGO that's working to connect to reconnect consumers or, or eaters as we are um, with their food. We also have Jaron Jantz, who's founder and co-director of the Inner Green Deal, which is an initiative to cultivate compassionate and sustainable leadership um, and working in particular with leaders at the, the European Commission, the European Parliament and at international corporations and NGOs. 
Last but not least, we're also joined by Katie Palmer, who's the founder of Food Sense Wales, which is a charity um, hosted within the Welsh National Health Service and is working with communities, organizations, policymakers, and governments to co-create a food system for Wales that is not only good for people, but also for the planet. Katie is also one of the founding directors of Veg Power, which is a non-profit organization um, on a 10-year mission to turn around vegetable consumption in the UK. So welcome, welcome to you all. So Maximilian, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so would you be able to share a bit more information about the central role of consciousness and inner development in Sakim's approach um, and your future plans with the Conscious Food Systems Alliance? Thank you very much. It is a pleasure um, to start after such a nice intervention from Geelong. Thank you. Um, I think it's a special island that was created uh, for a short moment in this um, bigger COP uh, arena here, which is for sure a state of headspace, busyness. And now um, I like this very much that we invite a hard space to speak from. And also thank you for your artistic intervention in the beginning. I mean, the journey of Sikkim started truly from this inner space of a heartfelt need to come back home from um, my grandfather-in-law, Ibrahim Abolesh, who started this initiative in 1977, seeing societal challenges and feeling the inner need to do something about it because it would have been easy for him to stay wherever he were, he was, and have a beautiful life, a luxury life, somewhere in Europe. But he decided to co come back to his home country and to do something in the middle of the desert where nothing was existing, only his vision. A vision that is probably, you know, considered today and also back in the days as crazy, because how can you start something when you see nothing in front of you and have maybe 200 years to achieve it. So I think we can only go for this if we have the strong inner clarity and vision. And I think that's a pretty important thing for us to realize and to invite the space. And of course, he was also realistic and knew that entrepreneurship has to come in. So his approach was starting with nature and creating value out of this with an entrepreneurial drive. And when he got his first um, loan from a bank, what has he done? He has uh, invested into a tractor and he has invested into a piano, a grand piano, okay? In the middle of the desert. Why? Because culture is as important as the rest. And it also is included in the name agriculture. It's not an agro technical economic endeavor but it's a it's a, it's it's an, a human intervention together with nature together with nature developing the earth and we knew since the start that when you are in the desert you cannot do it if you do not develop people because obviously when you work with nature and you confront challenges from having no fertility in the soil to where do I get the water? Where, how do I create a product out of that? It's so much challenges that you cannot deal with when you are just having someone being paid with a salary and have no intrinsic motivation to solve it. So you have to have a community that is really linked to the challenges at hand. When you invite the community, you get families, you get kids, and then there's a need for education. And this need for education goes actually lifelong. For me, culture and for us also means unfolding potential and working on consciousness development um, because that's an evolutionary journey we have to go through as humankind. And at SECM, I would say this is at the heart. So when we are working in all the cultural, agricultural life and the economic life, it presents a huge opportunity to learn, to learn from the challenges and to invite also the time that we are together for uh, education. And this is called core program um, in our case. And it uh, has to do a lot with arts. And uh, Suraya said, and Ahmed El Shazli, they are working with me 
and the different institutions, the Egyptian uh, Biodynamic Association for Farmers and the Heliopolis University and SICKEM, we are all having a core program. That means 10% of our time is spent with artistic interventions, potential unfolding and social, um, let's say institutions like festivals or morning circles and, and so on. Um, in the end, it is trying to evoke a sense of an inner question because this inner question it needs to be there. Otherwise, human development cannot be prescribed. You can just create a conducive environment where this inner question can learn. And maybe I, I say two or three things how we can work together before I give it uh, to the next speaker. Um, because we have 2,000 employees, 600 uh, pupils, and 3,000 students working with us, all driven by this local initiative, there's so much education going on, and I think we have to work on reinventing that education. Reinventing it by inducing more heart space and more practical hand, hand space, not only in the mind. Because when I look at the curricula uh, in the university or in the schools, it's full of mind information and so on. So we need to really invite that and break that open and try to go out into life and have the courage to go on the field as a class or as a kind of uh, employees who are working normally in the factory, go to the field and experience where this food, where this product like textile or so is coming from. And this is for us the core program. And this is for us um, this kind of important step on a journey towards social innovation when you need to understand or when you need to expand your, your, your consciousness of seeing the world in a different way. Because as many people we have, as many different views there are existing on how we see the world, from a farmer to a factory worker, to a teacher, to a professor, to a business manager, to a salesperson. There's so many different reasons of why we do this. And I think we just have to acknowledge that we are all on a journey and um, that this is the beauty and the art and the social dance of allowing these different perspectives to coexist, but creating a space of where to um, look at these perspectives, exchange and create a sense of irritation. Because you can imagine if you invite a manager to suddenly draw and spend one hour of his time to make a painting or to work on uh, um, something like uh, clay handwork, the question is why? This is not efficient. But in the end, we see in the business that we do that we are really efficient. We are really economically very successful. Why? Well, perhaps, it, perhaps it's because we are doing a lot of effort to maintain a cultural development. And this is also for the farmers and the technical engineers who work with the farmers. And I'm happy to exchange more and become really more in, involved in this uh, Food Alliance, uh, Conscious, uh, conscious um, Food Systems Alliance um, in order so we can you know, bring it down and, and make more, more things happen in Egypt. Thank you so much for giving me the space and being here. Thank you so much, Maximilian. And yeah, just to, to emphasize one point you made around, you know, the disconnect that we're seeing now from, you know, where our food comes from, how it was made, who made it, you know, and, and I think that by connecting and preserving these cultures and knowledge and traditions that we that helps us very much becoming more 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 connected. Yeah. Just one comment on that. So we 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 took all this information along the value chain. And if you go on economyoflove.net, you will find that there is something called Impact Trace, where people can, with a QR code, look at that story. They see the farmer, they see uh, where the food is coming from, the textile is coming from, and they see the different steps. So it would be really great if you check that out, because we see, yes, technology can help, but it has to really start with the people in mind. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for, yeah, for mentioning that. Brilliant. And I think this, this leads us nicely into to our next um, speaker, Teresa, who's trying to, to make that connection between everyone. You know, we all, we all eat food. We all, you know, we all, we all need it to survive. So, um, Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about how the consciousness agenda intersects with your work um, and, and the projects, projects that you're currently developing as part of, of the Conscious Food Systems Alliance? Oh, I, I'm so... 
I'm so pleased to be here, you know, I'm in Rio now and very glad to be here, finally, uh, connecting to all of you and especially to COP27. So uh, my, my role started, my path started, uh, I, I was formerly a designer, but I always cooked. So I became a chef uh, and I had a partnership with my sister in a restaurant for more than 40 years. Uh, in the beginning of 2000, I joined the slow, foods, uh, slow food movement. And that was a really aha moment for me it was was really struck my mind because before I was, you know, chef and I realized that we had such a responsibility of being a chef because we are like this lost link between between the production and the consumption. So uh, when I came back from an event of slow food in Portugal, I decided I wanted to teach kids about their ancestrality. And I chose um, a group, uh, me and the group of Slow Food in Rio, we went into a school, a public school, where all the kids were from the slums in Rio. And it was very intuitive uh, action. And I realized that they only, the, the, all of us in Brazil, we have a staple food very important, which is manioc, cassava. So I realized that I, I decided to make this workshop of teaching about the origins of cassava, what you could do with cassava, the legend, the indigenous legend, uh, music and everything. So we started this first action as a very small uh, <laughs> thing and that grew, that grew a lot and the, the school started us to ask us to repeat the action. So for more than 10 years, we made this workshop about cassava that taught about uh, geography, history, legend, music, all the culture around cassava. But the most important thing, and at the end we taught the kids to make their own uh, tapioca tortillas, which is like the bread of indigenous people in Brazil. And, but the most important thing of this workshop was not to teach kids how to cook. Many people do that was more about teaching them how to connect. And that's, that's how, you know, the connection and the consciousness comes uh, to connect with their ancestrality. Because those kids from the, from the slums of Rio, they, their ancestors are from the Northeast and the North part of Brazil. And that part is exactly where manioc started. Manioc was a, a wild plant that was domesticated by indigenous people. So this crop was responsible for saving most of lives, you know, especially the poor people's lives in Brazil. So those kids, they didn't know that they, their ancestors were responsible for this life. So we started this workshop and that had some uh, unexpected effects. Uh, for instance, people at home, like the mothers, the very busy mothers, working mothers, thank us came to us and said thank you so much because my kids now they want to cook and so lots of little things that uh, was the effect of connection and consciousness that cooking was an act not only for consumptions but also that connect them not only to social biodiversity or to food but also to uh, their ancestors so this this was for um 10 years and when I joined the, the COFSA, it was very interesting because I realized that what I was doing and me and this group of eco chefs, because th then I founded the Instituto Maniva and the group of eco chefs, and we did lots of works with the same uh, attention to this connection. Uh, when I joined COFSA, I thought it was really interesting and really challenging because that Put, uh, put ourselves into the position of sharing this methodology. First of all, to create a methodology that could be shared with other crops, with other staple food. So now we are uh, doing this and we are, the idea is to offer this to other countries, other programs, and together to, in, to enhance and to deepen this consciousness of our connection to our land, to our ancestrality, 
in, a, in one hand to our biodiversity, in other hand to our people, the, the people around us. Um, so we, in Brazil, we, we started to do uh, like a network with other programs. Sinal do Vale, which is a, a, a non-profit organization, and, and Kairos, other. So we're starting our little COFSA group here in Brazil to, to make this connection. And I think it's very important for us to realize that here in this group and in this event, this huge event, we are, we are not comfortable. We are talking about a big crisis. We are talking about a big problem. It's not celebration time. It's emergency time. And, and why, why what, we can, what can we do? That's the, the, the big question mark. And one of the things we can do is to consume differently, to eat food differently, and to connect and to have the consciousness of what we are eating. And as someone said before, where it comes from, who is benefiting, uh, is it healthy to our body, is it healthy to earth? Uh, is it polluting the rivers? So this consciousness about eating and also in, in, in my point of view, the consciousness about, about cooking is something that really, really, I believe it can change the, the crisis that we are on. And, and one of the practice is one of the practices. And I think one of the important one is to start with kids because they are the future and they need to understand that eating habits is not only eating those big brands of you know ultra processed food and i think this is this is a small big revolution that we have to do thank you you had some some applause here in the room teresa um yeah absolutely i mean thank you for sharing the work that you're doing you know uh, connecting communities to ancestral foods in brazil and and the importance of especially connecting or helping kids connect better to where their food comes from. And we're, we're seeing, you know, there's so much processed food in, in, in our societies these days. So it is really important for, for our health and for the environment and for, for the smallholder farmers who, who are producing this food, we need to support them. So thank you, thank you for uh, that. Um, just to add, yes. uh, can I add just a little thing? The biggest Please. problem today with ind indigenous people in the Amazon is diabetes because they eat ultra-processed food. So that's what we are talking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So, Jaron, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in, in promoting sustainability um, and, and climate transition from within and how you intend to, to help support this through the COFSA? Over to you, thanks. Yes, thank you, Elana. Very happy to be here today with you at COP27. You know, our experience in, in addressing this human dimension of sustainability, uh, what we've been talking about today, has been, has been very positive. We build on a long tradition of leadership development and behavioral change and mindfulness, compassion, and also indigenous wisdom and methods that are well established but often new to sustainability world, uh, at least in particular in the West. Um, so after lots of research, we tailored our existing programs to the needs of this sustainability committee community and started with a large pilot, uh, including about 100 leaders uh, with people from the EU, so European institutions, but also companies and NGOs. And uh, this was an online program with six modules and it combined inner development, so exploring purpose, uh, cultivating compassion, overcoming mental biases. And it also included outer elements such as behavior change, collaboration and workplace initiatives. So in addition, people were, of course, invited to be out and to be out in nature and to do daily mindfulness and compassion based practices. Professor Wamsler, who spoke earlier today, has reviewed our programs and her findings demonstrated, amongst others, significant increase in climate agency, which is really important. So uh, giving people the sense that what they do matters. Also a significant increase in feeling connected to nature um, and a clear integration and willingness to, to bring this type of work into the workplace. So we've been 
very fortunate that our programs then have been included in the standard um, European learning catalog, making them available to all EU staff of all European institutions. And um, we also started increasingly partner with, uh, with, with organizations such as the Inner Development Goals. And we're now running together with them uh, programs for leaders in the Global South from countries like Costa Rica, Colombia, Zambia, Rwanda, and India, which is fantastic. And so of course, all these challenges uh, and our work is inherently global and universal. And then in addition, we are now preparing trainer trainer programs so that these type of um, programs and offerings can be scaled. Um, now to come back to your second part of your question. So what are we planning to bring to support the Conscious Food Systems Alliance? Um, well, first of all, we feel it's very critical to connect with and collaborate with all stakeholders in the global food system. And we're envisaging to do this via two initiatives and to scale these initiatives through the global network of UNDP and with a range of partners. So the first initiative is to convene major decision makers of the global food system. And then the second initiative is to train facilitators, field officers, community workers to support with people on the ground. And both initiatives are hugely ambitious and will really require massive support from, from a range of stakeholders from the global community, but also from donors. And let me say a little bit more about these initiatives. Starting with this um, global leadership program, as I said, we're looking to convene a broad community of leaders from organizations with really systemic impact on the global food system. So this includes, of course, policymakers, uh, business leaders from food and agricultural companies, um, farmer representatives, academics, biodiversity experts, and many others. And the purpose of the program would be to bring these people together and overcome and create a kind of an open and more safe environment so that transformation and uh, collaboration is possible and more possible. And then being able to, when you come together, when you look each other in the eye, to overcome old paradigms and self-limiting beliefs um, and, and cultivate transformative qualities such as system thinking, compassion, collaboration. And then finally, collaborate together, start working, creating small initiatives, concrete collaboration based on these inner qualities, which is very different than our habitual way of working. Now, we are looking actively for partners, so partners who want to join a program like this, so from the food and agricultural companies, but also yeah, from all the stakeholders I just mentioned, as well as uh, donor organizations who can fund a first pilot because we can do this small and that's great but we can also if we really want to have impact and looking at the time uh, you know we would like to reach at least 60 percent of the major systemic organizations over the next five years and that really needs uh, us to come together and then really passionate about also a second initiative which is to train facilitators and field officers and community workers to support people on the ground. In particular, of course, the, you know, the 600 million or so smallholder farmers that really feed billions of people and are hugely struggling, as we all know. Um, and ult ultimately, most of the pressure and the problems of our system falls on them. So I, I feel that we really need to support with them. And I feel the community that is here today with us can help and to be able to reach and support as many people on the ground as possible and in a way that respects and benefits the local context we will co-create the train the trainer program with local partners and then translate this program in various languages and support the facilitators on the ground with materials and the support they need and the nature of course of these programs is to build, restore communities, create safe places to talk about climate induced problems, in particular as it impacts their ability to grow crops, to sustain themselves and, and even survive. So for all of this to be able to have meaningful impact, we will need to work together and we feel very grateful to be part of the COFSA community and to connect with highly motivated, skilled and 
passionate people above all as we've been seeing today. So if you hear this and want to know more, I would invite you to reach out directly to the COFSA team. And of course, you're also free to connect directly with us at the Inner Green Deal. Um, and I'm very curious um, what will come and where we will be in a few years from now. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, just to, to emphasize what, what I was hearing from that is really the role of collaboration. So, you know, looking, working with, with grassroots organizations all the way up through SMEs, bigger, larger businesses, and all the way up to, to national policymakers. And as well around the, the, the importance of building capacities. So um, really looking at, at, at how we can, you know, like you're saying, the, these programs, these training programs to help build um, yeah, more meaningful impact. So, so thank you for that, Jaron. Um, and, and last but not least, uh, we have Katie. So thank you, uh, Katie, for joining us. Um, we, were, we were wondering if you'd also be able to tell us a little bit of your experience about, P, about being part of COFSA um, and the co-creation process and how transform, transformative this has been um, and how you're currently looking to integrate this agenda into your work um, as part of COFSA. Over to you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, good afternoon from Cardiff in Wales, where I live and work. Um, and probably, yeah, moving on to the local from Jerome's global um, picture, uh, probably tell you a bit more about um, how COFSA is impacting on the, on the local approaches. So I consider myself a food system practitioner, but I certainly am not an expert in um, consciousness. So my journey with COFSA really has been... Um, enlightening and enriching. Uh, but before I tell you about that bit, I want to set a little bit of context by telling you a little bit about Wales. So Wales is a small and beautiful country. It has a big heart and its own language, which around um, coming, well, there's an ambition for around 30% of the population to speak. And I want to just, just to share with you two Welsh words, um, which I associate with, with our inner capacities. So the first of these is a word um, that's hirai, which doesn't have a direct translation, but it means a nostalgic longing for a place. So that's hirai. Um, and another word that doesn't have a direct translation, um, but the word is kutch. And it basically means a cuddle or a hug. Um, but it actually means um, if you give someone a kutch, you're figuratively giving them a safe place. And I feel very much that mindfulness can create that safe place. So back to Wales. So we're part of the UK and we have our own parliament called the Seneth. And we have a number of devolved powers from UK government. Uh, these include agriculture, education, the NHS. There are many others. Um, but of most relevance for today uh, is a world first really in a piece of legislation called the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act. This sustainable development legislation places a duty on all public bodies to take consideration um, of future generations in all decision making. Um, and in fact, the commissioner Sophie Howe has been present at, at COP this week. The act operates across seven wellbeing goals um, and lays out five ways of working that the public bodies should be adopt to support better decision making. And these five ways of working are definitely relevant to COFSA's approach. It's about taking account of the long term, collaboration, integration, prevention, and involving um, people of all ages and diversity. And this leads me on to talk a bit more about my, how my COFSA journey began. One of the foundations of our work is to help build uh, a resilient food system by building a network of local food partnerships. These partnerships work across the system at a local level involving partners from all corners of that food system to build a vision and plan for a healthy and sustainable food in their area. There are 22 local authority areas in Wales and we want to see a partnership in each of these areas. Last year, uh, so going back to early in 2021, um, I had a meeting where I was discussing with colleagues this ambition um, of developing this uh, network of food partnerships. And at that meeting, I was introduced to the Sustainable Development Change Manager at Welsh Government. After this meeting, she introduced me to Thomas, 
suggesting that I may be a good candidate to contribute to COFSA and the breathing room. And I'm going to admit at this point that I was skeptical. What was this breathing room about? I found it difficult to comprehend, but after speaking to Thomas um, and deciding whether or not I wanted to commit my time, um, I actually went with my gut feeling and I knew I should be taking part. And before I knew it, I was practicing mindfulness online, which was definitely a first for me. Um, and I'd be pleased to hear that I do get it and I do understand. The breathing room process uh, and contributing to the group on developing the manifesto in particular for COFSA has really helped me to crystallize the importance of consciousness approaches and help me to realize that the approaches and values that we were already actually taking as a team within our work, um, especially around building um, the importance of building relationships back into the food system, we were actually already doing, but just didn't quite realize um, the, the importance of that. So fast forwarding 12 months, um, and Welsh Government has now made funding available to support us in developing that network of food partnerships across Wales. I've taken my learnings from COFSA and brought mindfulness approaches into my own team. Uh, we spent three afternoons um, with Vishva, Vishvapani Bloomfeld, who's Director of Mindfulness in Action in Wales, to build our understanding of the application of mindfulness to our own work and to our own lives. We've introduced some small things which make a big difference, such as Tuesday morning connections, where we meet as a team with no agenda, just to create a space to offload, celebrate something or to seek mutual support for something we're struggling with. And we're having our monthly team meeting in our local Buddha Centre, where we incorporate some mindfulness practice with a resident practitioner. This approach is bringing us closer together as a team and has increased confidence and trust between staff members. More widely, as a result of my COFSA journey, I'm now working with Welsh Government's Sustainable Development Change Manager around developing a community of practice to support the growing food partnership network in Wales. Part of this offer is training to build inner capacities linked to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, uh, their ways of working and using these techniques with colleagues in Welsh Government to approach area of conflict and to try and seek resolution. In fact, we had our first meeting yesterday um, and as partnerships develop across Wales, we will hope that our community of local food system practitioners will expand and develop. And in turn, these practitioners will expand the network with the people that they're working with in their local areas. Those of us working to make the food system better are constantly exposed to the devastation that poverty, climate change and nature loss is causing. And it is really difficult to escape and remain in a positive headspace and to keep that space for trying to push for solutions. And this is just one reason why COFSA is so important, to help practitioners navigate these challenges and remain in a positive problem solving space. To finish, I am really grateful to the connections I've made through Welsh Government and out to COFSA. I treasure the experience so far and I'm hope that um, I have reciprocated with my own experience as an initially slightly skeptical food systems pr practitioner um, to the group in return. And I'm really looking forward to the next steps of the COFSA journey. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Yeah, that's it's great to hear um, how you know you've you've been able to involve the Welsh government and your journey with COFSA and and how you're integrating some, some of these mindfulness approaches into your own team and your own work. So that's really great to hear, thank you. Um, so before I pass to Andrew for, for some very brief closing remarks and, and a short video, I would like to hand back to Vairoa for, for some reflections from her side. La cultura Arapanui tiene una cosmovisión y la cosmos, cosmovisión habla del cuidado del ser. Es como una flor, como la flor de la permacultura, pero el inicio de la cosmovisión es el cuidado del ser, desde su alimentación, eh, desde su descanso, desde su meditación, ahí agradezco la, la meditación, eh, desde lo que uno piensa, desde que, lo que uno dice, se llama el moa. Moa es el cuidado del ser, y desde ahí, Nosotros creamos este programa de los huertos familiares. So here, Maria, 
is explaining a bit uh, the Cosmovision uh, from uh, our people, which is about taking care of your inner self. And um, what, what's the name, in the name again? Moha, called Moha. And uh, yeah, it started from taking care of your inner self. Y bueno, nosotros tenemos mucho que aportar a través de, de esta cosmovisión, a través de este trabajo que estamos desarrollando, porque como decía ahí Tomás en su presentación, es muy importante potenciar eh, desde lo local, desde la alimentación, eh, desde lo local, porque al final lo que te da tu territorio es lo que tú necesitas para tu cuerpo, lo que llega de afuera donde vienen con un envase, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco envases, seis envases, para que uno pueda recién alimentarse. ¿Qué hace uno con, con ese envase? Así so, que all the external products is what is feeding ourselves. So I didn't know what she was also saying before, from taking care of your inner self, it's then when uh, you can also take care of the external world and the others. Y solamente para, para terminar, eh, la cultura milenaria de, de nuestros ancestros, del, eh, imagínense lo, mis ancestros que crearon estos moai de 10 metros, de cientos de, tan, de toneladas que los movieron por 20 kilómetros. Ellos se alimentaban de, de tubérculos, de verduras, de peces, ese era su alimento, imagínense lo fuerte que ellos eran. Entonces todo lo que nosotros necesitamos está en nuestro territorio. Y es por lo mismo que nosotros creamos eh, y estamos creando políticas locales para ir frenando toda esta oleada de productos y de alimentos que no necesitamos. So, uh... Local people were so strong when they were able to build the Mohai, Mohai and they were feeding with local resources and fish and, and um, vegetables from the country. So they have already everything that they need in the country. And uh, they're developing uh, policies to, to stop, to prevent external and processed food from entering the country. Entonces, Agradecer el espacio. Eh, nosotros, yo soy la encargada de la municipalidad, de, encargada medioambiental de la municipalidad de Rapanui, una institución indígena local que estamos trabajando desde la cosmovisión para nuestra comunidad. Muchas veces nos falta apoyo, apoyo financiero, eh, pero igual hacemos las cosas, la, hacemos las cosas por el cariño que le tenemos a, al territorio a nuestra cultura y a nuestra comunidad. Muchas gracias. To conclude, she's also working in a local council and to take care of the environment and uh, also spreading love with the care of the environment and local policies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for, for sharing that and, and what you're doing in your community and with your, your local governments. And yeah, thank you so much. Mil gracias. <laughs> so I will, I will um, briefly hand over to, to Andrew for the closing remarks, um, which will be followed by, by a video. So thank you so much. Over to you, Andrew. Okay. Well, thank you, Alana, for your wonderful moderation. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, you've made my job very easy. I think you've said it all. There's very little for me to say, and I know we're also out of time. Um, so thank you all, and thank you to the COFSA team, all of our COFSA partners, and of course you, all the participants who have chosen to spend your time uh, with us. And I wish you all uh, a very good COP. Um, I do hope, I, I certainly have felt that this has been a, a fantastic event, and I hope you all um, had you know, similar experiences to me in finding this work the speakers, what we're talking about, you know, supportive, enjoyable, because it's, um, it's important that we enjoy our work, uh, and, but also inspirational and visionary. You know, I think what we're trying to do here 
bl blending consciousness with food systems is is the way forward and you know i think you saw it in the balance of speakers between speakers who are more consciousness experts and bringing it to food systems but also food systems experts who are trying to bring consciousness into their work and and this is it's always where the innovation is i think isn't it and the uniqueness and the complexity is where we work at the interface uh and the edges between different fields and bringing them together and so you know for for, for me at UNDP we're very proud and feel privileged to be supporting this work and working with all of our partners we see the value in bringing consciousness not only into our food systems work but into all of our development work we know it's fundamental for helping have more impact uh, from everything that we do um as you've uh, i think learned you know kofsa was still we're still quite young and small uh, as a movement as an alliance in terms of our thinking and actions on the ground but we are growing and we're growing fast and we have a lot of momentum. And so I certainly encourage all of you uh, to join us. And we welcome you all joining us from all over the world as we as we continue this movement and try to make some meaningful change with, with everything going on in this in this crazy but beautiful world. So thank you all. Thank you for the time. And uh, I hand back to you, Alana, but wish you all a very good day and a good COP. Thank you so much, Andrew. And to close, I think we have a, a launch video from from Kofsa. So I'll pass it to Al, um, Naomi. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Thank you for your time. Welcome to COFSA, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. It is now time to unlock food systems transformation for the nourishment of all people and the regeneration of the planet. Global food systems are at breaking point and our current policy solutions and technical innovations are not delivering the change we need. To create more regenerative systems, we need to access deeper levers of change. Crisis begins within us in how we see and relate to the world. While food connects us fundamentally with the earth and with one another, the current global food system is shaped by a deep cultural story of separation that sets individuals apart from other beings and with nature. This inner disconnection manifests in dysfunctional food systems, hungry children, obesity epidemics, and farmers' despair, extractive production practices, devastated landscapes, and biodiversity loss. While these issues are embedded in structural inequalities and the disempowerment of the most marginalized stakeholders, they are also rooted in our collective consciousness. To activate solutions, we must therefore also look within, shifting the collective ways of being, thinking and doing that have produced the current crisis. The time has come to build the inner foundations of sustainable food systems. The Conscious Food Systems Alliance COFSA is a movement of food, agriculture and consciousness practitioners convened by UNDP and united around a common goal. To support people from food and agriculture systems to cultivate the inner capacities that activate systemic change and regeneration. We aim to complement existing approaches, exploring ways to integrate evidence-based consciousness practices such as mindfulness, compassion, nature connection, nonviolent communication, self-reflection into food systems initiatives. These practices foster the awareness, connection and creativity that can unlock structural solutions. We know that these practices are effective and their value in supporting sustainability at multiple levels is increasingly recognized. We also know that they are not new. Indigenous and traditional wisdom have embraced these practices for millennia within a holistic understanding of food and the natural world. 
Hafsaq is a bold vision on the role of consciousness in food system transformation. Around this shared purpose, diverse stakeholders are uniting, co-creating and adapting approaches to their own contexts and learning from each other. Reconnection begins here. Join a growing community of practitioners exploring pathway toward conscious food systems. Thank you, everyone.